Hello and welcome to this webcast about fatigue and over the next half an hour or so I will hopefully be able to teach you a little bit about managing your own fatigue and preventing it from becoming a well-being and safety issue. So somebody once said that the first virtue of a soldier is the endurance of fatigue and I think that this will resonate with all of us because we all know what it's like to feel that. We know what's expected of us. We're meant to work tirelessly. We're not meant to complain about fatigue. It is just part of the job. Of course you're sleep deprived. Of course you drive home after no sleep. Of course you don't get to sleep during your night shifts. Um, of course this causes cause significant impairment to your functioning and to your quality of life, etc. But it is just the way it has to be. It's part of the job. So this is an excerpt from an entry by the secret doctor in the BMJ in November 2016. We don't know who the secret doctor is, um, but if it is one of you, then I applaud you. Thank you for writing it. So this doctor had spent a busy night in recess and was exhausted and no longer firing on all cylinders. And he or she wrote, the consultant arrived into recess, fresh, friendly, smiling. And I just looked at him and said, I'm so tired. In all my years in medicine, I have never used those words as an excuse. Now, I think you'll agree that this is a pretty damning insight into the psyche of doctors. And this individual is admitting that fatigue is an excuse and an excuse to be ashamed of. And clearly he is not proud or she is not proud of the fact that they are having to admit to their own fatigue and are blaming their suboptimal functioning on fatigue. It's incredible that as a group of educated physiologists, we are not yet evolved enough within the profession to accept that the laws of physiology and physics are somewhat less applicable to doctors. Airline pilots get a load of rest, they're responsible for other people's lives, and nobody would ever dream of expecting them to fly a 747 across the Atlantic on no sleep. Yet for some reason, this does not translate to doctors. Everybody knows this is the case. We don't talk about it enough, we haven't spoken about it enough up until this point, but thankfully we're reaching a stage whereby this is becoming an acceptable topic of conversation. So fatigue has become a really hot topic over the past couple of years and it's not because people are all of a sudden far more exhausted than they ever have been. It's just the timing and other things which are conspiring within the general politics of healthcare which have pushed us forward to a point as a group of professionals whereby we feel able to talk about our own well-being and safety. And People have always been saying to me since I embarked upon all this fatigue work how difficult their lives were as trainees in comparison to what lives of trainees are like now. Um, and if I had a pound for every time somebody said, well, when I was a trainee, uh, I'd be a very rich woman. So apparently they used to work 100 and 150 hours a week. They never used to get any sleep. They'd stay on site for days and days on end. And I have no doubt that this is very true. But times were different then and are very di were very different then to the, the kind of situation that we find ourselves in now. So whilst, yes, people did work far longer hours and uh, their actual working patterns were far less hospitable, things were different. The patient population was different. The expectations of patients and families were different. The expectations of the doctor were different. And their working patterns, whilst onerous were probably somewhat less intense and I think people had access to rest facilities overnight and rest facilities in the day, the facilities to and the opportunities to eat uh, and to shower and to get your washing done for you um, so you had a fresh shirt to put on in the morning etc were there and they're not there now. The nursing staff looked after the doctors and I think the doctors looked after the nursing staff, the organisation looked after everybody and there was generally more of a sentiment of co-care. Um, the retirement age was lower then and earnings were significantly higher. So between 2005 and 2015, the earnings of a doctor dropped, approximately dropped by 22%, and that's for hospital doctors. And this was in association with an increase in the cost of living of between two and 3%. And if you look at the landscape now, 
things have changed dramatically even in the past 10 or 15 years. The burden of the requirements of the training program are significant and not to be underestimated. The burden of assessments and exams and extra stuff in inverted commas that we need to do, audits, research, projects, quality improvement, mandatory training, etc. A lot of this is done within our own time. The population is aging and for intensive care doctors this is very significant because it's such a rapidly growing specialty and our population is aging and they're, they're living well for much longer and this places significant demands on the service. The European Working Time Directive was undoubtedly a very welcome introduction but has not come at um, a certain cost to other elements of work. People are probably less happy within their jobs than they were say 20 years ago. The bed pressures and the pressures on staffing numbers are unparalleled and everybody feels under pressure every single day that they're in work. The effects of fatigue are widespread and they can range from relatively minor effects such as those caused by making small errors and impairment of immunity for example to far more devastating effects such as the loss of life or function either of ourselves or of other people. The individuals featured in these clips are those who have either lost their own lives or have devastated the lives of other people due to driving when fatigued. Currently under UK law, if one is found guilty of causing death by driving when fatigued, one can face up to a 14 year custodial sentence. And it goes without saying that for many reasons, life will obviously never ever be the same again. What actually is fatigue? Is it just being tired? Is it being physically tired? Is it being mentally tired? The answer is there are loads of different definitions, but ultimately it is a state of suboptimal performance, which is multifactorial and is caused not only by sleep deprivation, but other things such as poor circadian rhythm function, chronic stress, poor sleep patterns, ill health, and what we do know is that people who are fatigued do not function optimally. Now this applies to their physical level of function, their emotional function, their ability to deal with life stresses, and also even simple things such as deranged physiology and immunity. People who work night shifts gain weight, they have impaired glucose tolerance, their insulin sensitivity is different to those people who do not work night shifts and their immunity is impaired. We did a survey of the effects of fatigue amongst anaesthetic trainees in the UK and Ireland in 2017. We got about a 59% response rate which is very encouraging and whilst it didn't give us information that we weren't expecting, what it did allow us to do was collate this information and immortalise it in publication form which is evidently the very best tool for promoting change. This is an open access publication, so all of the results are online if you're interested, but in a nutshell, about three quarters of people find that fatigue has a negative impact on all areas of their life, and 57% of anaesthetics trainees admitted to having either had an accident or a near miss when driving home after night shifts. And what was quite interesting was that people travel for greater distances than we'd probably thought so most people travel for between 30 and 60 minutes uh, in each direction every day and this is obviously likely to reflect the situation for anybody on training programme. We all need between seven and a half and nine hours sleep a night and if we don't get this sleep we become fatigued. The problem with fatigue in the long term and in the short term is it leads to varying degrees of global impairment. Now what we do know is that fatigue is cumulative. It's not just based on one night of inadequate sleep. It is a complex phenomenon and depends on lots of areas of, of life. So for doctors and nurses, a high workload, lack of breaks, and the actual scheduling of our shift is very important. Unpredictability is exhausting. You can plan for your life if you work antisocial shifts but these shifts are easily predictable in advance. 
the actual nature of the work and the location that you work in is very important as well. So if you are constantly flitting between A&E recess, cardiac ITU, theatres, general ITU, so you're working within different environments with different problems, different staff, etc. This is hugely significant. If we actually think about how that particular situation might make demands upon our cognition, it's easy to see how that type of working pattern and working environment can rapidly become exhausting. So lots of what we do is repetitive and we rely on that to be able to get us through these times where demands are high. However, if you're constantly having to draw on other areas of your cognition in order to sustain the work that you're doing because it's constantly a new environment, this can rapidly lead to depletion. What happens when our working pattern and our workload and the nature of our working day lead to this cognitive and physical depletion, which in turn lead to suboptimal functioning? Well, the work of Daniel Kahneman, who is an American-Israeli psychologist, uh, leads us to understand that we have two types of thinking process. We've got type 1 thinking and type 2 thinking. Now, the type 1 thinking is the type of thinking that we do automatically. So it's what we use when we're driving a car, when we're crossing the road, when we're making a cup of tea, for example. This is very rapidly accessible thinking. It's quick. It's not challenging. It's not exhausting. And a lot of the time, it's bang on. The other type of thinking, which is far more exhausting, is the type two thinking. And this is where we use experiences and thought process and our general experience and cues from our environment and a whole load of emotional components in order to make what we feel is a balanced and accurate assessment and judgment. Now this type 2 thinking is very interesting because it has a basis. We know that as people become exhausted their natural inclination is to resort from the labour-intensive type 2 thinking into type 1 thinking. Interestingly enough type 1 thinking is associated with risk-taking behaviour such as gambling. And I'll let you come to your own conclusions about how this may play out with patient care and commuting. As we are all only too aware, our alertness and capability vary with the time of day. So there are slumps between about 3 and 5 a.m. and 3 and 5 p.m. The 3 to 5 a.m. slump correlates with the highest rate of road traffic accidents among long-distance lorry drivers. Similarly, the ability that we possess to fall asleep also varies with the time of day. And ironically, the most difficult time of day to fall asleep is between half past 10 and half past 11 in the morning, which is exactly when every night shift worker is actually trying to get to sleep after a busy shift. Your sleep debt can only be replaced with sleep. And when you sleep after you recruit a sleep debt is going to impact on how well you recover from your fatigue and the sleep that we miss out on overnight is never going to be fully repaid by the sleep that you have during the day. And this is because not all sleep is equal and circadian rhythm disruption is very potent. We are hardwired to sleep overnight and to not really sleep in the day. And as such, the ability that we have to fall asleep and remain asleep and actually to undergo a full set of sleep cycles is impaired and this is a lot to do with the environment in which we sleep and this is likely to be due in part to factors affecting the circadian rhythm such as light and noise and temperature however there are going to be other elements involved such as external disturbances and melatonin release and feeding schedules. It will come as no great surprise to you that shift work is the work of the devil and this is because fatigue is cumulative and we lose on average 1.5 hours in each 24 hour period for every night shift that we work. And this is because of the reasons I've just referred to. So no matter how well you sleep before, during and after night shifts, and no matter how well you look after yourself during your night shift working period by eating properly, eating at appropriate times, taking exercise and exposing yourself to natural daylight, for example, you cannot avoid accruing fatigue as a result of your working pattern. 
A few years ago, a study was undertaken amongst anaesthetists in New Zealand, and 32% of these anaesthetists surveyed admitted to having made a fatigue-related mistake within the previous six months. And I think that this is probably not an accurate reflection of reality. And that's because there will have been a group of people who did not want to admit to having made a mistake, and also those who had no idea that they'd actually made a mistake. So I suspect in reality, this number is far greater than we have quoted there at 32%. I'm now going to use a personal example of where fatigue was present during my working day and how this impacted on my decision making process. So on the 6th of the 9th I was third on um, call for intensive care and I had a, a junior registrar with me, an excellent junior registrar but junior nonetheless. And we were incredibly busy. We had a very sick patient in any recess, not to mention uh, 28 other patients to look after. And we didn't get the opportunity to have any physical break. I'm pretty sure neither of us ate. I certainly didn't. And we were receiving constant calls from the, the department. Now, I understand the responsibilities of the nurses and the position that they're in but often they they phone to give you information that they are required to give you in order to protect themselves but this is not important information and it's not something that needs to be acted on and actually it just serves to provide an ever-increasing cognitive load and take away from your concentration and decision-making process about other things so um, this continued barrages of phone calls and a very tricky case. Um, by five o'clock in the morning, I was beginning to see words on the page which were starting to swarm and was failing to actually be able to select the right words that I needed in order to say what it was that I wanted to say. And it came to my attention, uh, thanks to a very diligent uh, junior nurse, that I prescribed a 250 ml bolus of frusamide. This was followed at six o'clock by me prescribing gentamicin on the wrong chart. Now I had thoroughly checked. I had checked the patient, checked the chart, cross-checked for allergies, etc. But I'd failed to notice that the patient and the name on the chart were not the same individual. And then at 7.30 in the morning there was a cardiac arrest call out to a ward. Now I've worked in that hospital for 15 years um, on and off and I went to completely the wrong place and I knew exactly where I was meant to be going but I was distracted and went somewhere else delaying my subsequent arrival at the we've accepted that fatigue is a big problem and what can we do to minimize the effects of fatigue and prevent it becoming an ongoing issue that impairs our function and encroaches on our ability to do our jobs and, and lead good lives we would ideally not work shifts, but due to the nature of our jobs, shifts are well and truly here to stay, or at least some form of overnight and out of hours working. The most prominent features of the environment in which we live that affect our sleep and also our ability to stay awake and actually go to sleep are light, activity levels and feeding schedules. Natural light is what we call a Zeitgeber and it is, this means it's a giver of time and it is actually something which guides our circadian rhythm. The absence of natural light is what causes melatonin release, which is why when you go camping you tend not to have problems falling asleep because there is usually very little natural light and very little artificial light. So when the natural light goes, our brains are absolutely geared up to start to sleep. Melatonin is released and within half an hour, 45 minutes of that happening, we tend to get the inclination to sleep. Likewise, staying up late at night, using screens, electronic devices, watching television, sitting with multiple lamps on in your living room, these are things which are going to impair your ability to fall asleep. More on the topic of screens. Well, Televisions, mobile phones, Kindles, etc. emit blue light and this is instrumental in impairing the onset of sleep. You can spend 20 quid on Amazon and buy blue light cancelling glasses and this means that you can use your devices up until the moment when you actually want to go to sleep without any major impact on your 
sleep onset latency. Alcohol is one of these tricky things because people subjectively feel that it relaxes them and they fall asleep more easily. Unfortunately, the reality is that it doesn't improve sleep. It causes sedation and you don't actually complete restorative sleep cycles after consuming alcohol and therefore you're often better off just leaving alone when you need to actually be able to guarantee yourself good sleep. Likewise, prescribed sedatives are a very short-term solution to what's potentially a long-term problem, i.e. you struggling to sleep in between nights. This is going to be the case for your entire careers in some way, shape or form. It's much better to find a way of being able to manage that. It sounds preachy, I know, but the reality of having to rely on drugs in order to be able to do your job essentially in order to guarantee a certain amount of sleep in, in order to be able to function is an unfortunate position that you don't really want to get yourselves into. They can be associated with memory impairment, it's dangerous to drive in the morning after having taken night sedation, it impairs again sleep cycles and one of the most alarming features, particularly with some of the Z drugs, is the presence of rebound insomnia within 48 hours of taking the medication. Some people find melatonin supplements useful, two milligrams at 10 o'clock or whatever, half an hour before you plan to go to sleep. And there are a whole raft of other mechanisms to assist in going to sleep, such as meditation and relaxation, audios, etc. Getting outside in the natural light, as painful as it may be after a night shift, is actually very good because it will make you feel better. And the reason for this is not only is it pleasant, but it actually entrains the circadian rhythm into thinking that it's the daytime and ensuring that your body behaves accordingly. Also, if you have been exposed to natural light in the day, your sleep in the evening is likely to be better due to the fact that the absence of light will be significant enough to allow good melatonin release. The natural inclination after finishing a night shift is to just to go home and have a really long sleep. However, sometimes you stand to gain far more by just staying awake for as long as you can. So if you get home, sleep for two or three hours, just enough for you to be able to function, have low expectations of yourself for the rest of that day and try to get to bed at a reasonable time in keeping with what would be considered to be a normal bedtime for you. You may not fall asleep immediately when you do do that. You're likely to have a degree of sleep disturbance. But if you follow these rules, you're likely to find that you rediscover some semblance of a normal sleep pattern. Some areas where we can have much more control are home and lifestyle organisation. It's always worth paying for a cleaner, paying for a little bit of extra childcare, for example, if it means that it takes some pressure off you and allows you to have better sleep. You being rested and you being safe stands to benefit everybody far more than if you take on more than you can actually manage. I know it's not always that simple and not everybody's in a position to be able to do this, but where possible do consider limiting the amount that you are required to do on these particularly difficult days where sleep is going to be an issue. Ultimately, you stand to gain far more from sleeping properly and outsourcing some of the other tasks that you have to do. A talk about sleep and shift workers without mentioning the circadian rhythm would be incomplete. So the circadian rhythm is a, well, it's, it's actually any process which repeats itself over 24 hours and is independent. Despite the fact it's independent, it can be influenced by external factors. And the main factors that influence the circadian rhythm in humans are light exposure and feeding patterns. Activity levels can also significantly influence the circadian rhythm. And these features, so the light exposure and the activity levels and feeding regimes are known as sight givers and these, this means the givers of time. And the most instrumental of all sight givers is probably natural light. And I emphasise natural versus artificial because despite how it may feel um, when you're working in a busy theatre or a busy hospital overnight, uh, 
natural light is actually a lot more luminous than artificial light. And by being savvy with our exposure to natural light, we can have quite a significant influence over the way we fall asleep. Likewise, our levels of alertness in the day. It's the absence of natural light which stimulates the release of melatonin, which in turn leads us to develop the sensation of wanting to fall asleep. And in fact, exposure to artificial light is probably a significant contributor to poor sleep among our patients. But all is not lost for shift workers because we are now in a position to be able to reproduce natural light with specific devices. And for example, one of these is the human charger. There are many similar devices on the market and I have absolutely no affiliation whatsoever with this particular device I'm just using as an example. This device reproduces natural light with a very high luminosity output and it transmits this light via probes which are designed to be inserted into the ear. And the light that it emits is detected by photoreceptors on the ventral aspect of the brain. When used at appropriate times it can help to alleviate the symptoms of jet lag for example. It is known to assist in the management of depression and anxiety and can enhance your psychomotor performance, which is no great surprise, really. We are aware of the risk factors that are posed to us by the presence of fatigue. We understand that we have to address it. We understand that we have to minimise it. We understand that we have to manage our expectations and modify our behaviour in order to cater for the problems associated with fatigue. But we've still got a job to do. We are doctors, we work in an acute environment and we provide 24-hour care. And unfortunately, lots of our work is unscheduled and rest breaks are unpredictable. To expect to have regular and properly timed rest breaks with bleep cover would be an ideal situation. And it may be possible in certain hospitals but I suspect that for the vast majority of us, this is a long, long way off. And therefore, we need to manage our expectations of what we're able to deliver. Having said that, we mustn't be defeatist and we must stand up for what is right and what we're entitled to and what ultimately enhances everybody's safety. As doctors, our greatest resource is going to be other doctors. We can help each other to achieve rest breaks. This will involve both encouraging colleagues to actually take rest breaks, but affording them the opportunity to have uninterrupted periods of rest by taking bleeps and answering phones etc. Depending on your unit size and the number of colleagues that you have working with you, it might be worth talking to the nursing staff on the unit and potentially discussing the option of bleep filtering or saving up uh, non-essential requests. This is likely to be particularly the case for smaller units with fewer members of staff providing cover. So when you do have the opportunity to rest, where should you rest? Ideally, you will all have some kind of access to rest facilities. However, we know that at present, these are not ubiquitous, although we hope that they will be in the future. Until that time, you need to find somewhere dark and quiet to ideally lie down. Bearing in mind that any form of light or external stimulus will impair the ability with which you are going to be resting. A surgical mess, for example, which is a shared space, is not an adequate rest facility. Unless you're in a position to be able to guarantee that it's going to remain quiet and dark. Unfortunately, whilst the organisations for which we work undeniably have a duty of care to their staff. The ultimate responsibility for our behaviour and for our actions resides with us. And one of the first duties of a doctor is to do no harm. And this extends to management of our own fatigue. We must do everything that we can in order to ensure that our health is optimised and to not adversely affect the health and safety of others. So where does all this information leave us then? What are we meant to do? There's probably never been a better time for junior doctors and senior doctors to feel supported in looking after their own health and well-being and managing their own fatigue. Unpredictable working patterns, 
frequent changes of working environment, frequent changes of the staff with whom we work, circadian rhythm disruption, large commute distances, extracurricular commitments, the burden of assessment, all these things are very instrumental in the development of fatigue amongst doctors. It goes without saying that fatigue and sleep deprivation are a massive problem for nursing staff as well. We need to bear this in mind. But ultimately the crux of the matter is that we need to ensure that we are able to function safely during our working period and also return home safely. We need to be in the best position for making proper, considered, safe decisions and this means being in a good position to use type 2 thinking methods. And the only way that we are going to be able to achieve that is by looking after ourselves and ensuring that we get maximum high quality rest before a working period and taking regular adequate rest breaks whilst during the working period. And the way that we do this is by being open and honest about fatigue levels and our need for rest and requesting the help and assistance of colleagues and allied staff. As a group of progressive professionals we can work together to ensure that we create a far better restful environment for all. So I urge you to please discuss your own fatigue, appraise your own fatigue levels and where you have examples of good practice, then please share these so that we can learn from what other people do and so that we can also recognise the efforts made by different working environments. But for now, I'd like you to think about what we have talked about today and just do what you can with what you have where you are. So that's the end of the fatigue webcast. Please stay safe, stay rested and do look after each other. Thank you very much.